Welcome back, Zero K fans, to Natalie is at Dawn. I remain your host, Chad Fury333, and this match is going to be between Dying Friend and Anir on Vitra. So Dying Friend is pretty much the matchmaker player right now. They're they are the person that if you're likely playing matchmaking, you're probably going to face them at some point because they like their matchmaking, and I respect that. I like the matchmaking system too. Anir, on the other hand, much more of a big teams player. We're oftentimes more in the you know, room with 12 to 18 people just fighting it out. The giant, like, 6v6 to 10v10 game, which is, I mean, that's generally a thing that's up at just about all times. So, you know, if you like your massive, weird games, massive cluster games, then, you know, that's that's the thing you can do. The game supports that. But we're doing what we want today. And generally, always. Anyway, die in front of the Shieldbot Factory, Anir with the Cloakybot Factory. Pretty classic matchup. And you're coming in with a couple glaives just to scout out a little bit. And the same thing for Dying Frame with the Bandits. Overall, the openings from both players are pretty typical. This is essentially your textbook opening. Especially what Dying Frame's doing. And here is a little bit riskier with the wind generators, though I like it just for the amount of energy it's generating. Like, it's definitely worth it if Anir can keep that alive. But it's a matter of whether or not they can keep that alive. Because as long as they do, they're going to get way more overdrive. And an easier time maintaining... Easier time maintaining any of their economy, but at the same time, bandits coming in here are going to be causing a massive problem to that exact economy that Anir wants to preserve. But at this point, Anir is essentially kind of stuck. I mean, any attacks coming in here from Diamond are going to have a massive amount of value just because of how much damage they can deal to the wind generators, how much damage they can deal to the metal extractors as well, mostly because of the placement of the Lotus up in the front. Dying Front, on the other hand, has the Lotus in a position where it becomes far harder to deal with... Well, rather, to raid. Far harder to raid. It's way easier to deal with raiders. And like I said, that's Dying Front being textbook. It's the only way I can really describe it right now. That being said, Anir does have a bit of a counterattack coming in here with the five or so glaives. Which will be of some use if they manage to get past the bandits. And that is always the big thing. Five, ban five glaives versus two bandits. This one position play... Could be the make or break play that actually gives Anir the room to get rid of Dimefront's base, but that timing window has completely closed. Ship has sailed, and Anir is forced to retreat. Dimefront is able to regroup, and five bandits versus five glaives is a definite win for the bandits. Even with six glaives, or actually seven glaives, kind of thing, but even that's going to be tricky for Anir. But Anir has enough confidence they might be able to pull this off, and actually they might just, depending on micromanagement. But unfortunately, Anir already losing a couple bandits to no, sorry, to a couple glaives with no bandits lost in return. Anir wisely going for the Ripper. I'm not the Ripper. Calling out the Reaver. Going for the Reaver instead. Now what the Warriors are called. Because you kind of need that when you're considering that you're facing down a bunch of raiders and your own raiders can't go to toe with can't go toe to toe with them. You might want to bring in a riot unit or two. Or just the one. Looks like just the one. That's slightly out of position as well. Does Anir have radar? Anir does not have radar. Actually, no. Anir does have radar. How did that happen? That's actually kind of surprising. I'd expect they'd be able to see where the bandits were going, but they didn't. And at the same time, Dimefriend just continues to build more bandits. I mean, Dimefriend is not scared. They see that Reaver. They know that it's there. They know at this point there's only the one. And they figure they can get away with this. At this point, though, Dimefriend just has a production capacity. They have more money. They don't have caretakers yet, but they're probably going to get one soon. And while their commander is idle, they do still have a lot of build power on the field should they need it. One thing, though, they don't have an, as much energy. Actually, they do. I mean, relative to metal is more what I mean. And this is the one other thing about the wind generators. They are not as reliable. Anir does have enough energy, just barely, but... Yeah, not as reliable. They're currently at the minimum point four in Vitra... That's a map where I'd say build some wind generators, but don't rely on them. They're not necessarily going to provide value for money like they would on a map like Trojan Hills. Now, that being said, Anir's Reaver finally getting some value in here. Bandit's forced to retreat, and that is going to be... Oh, possibly a trap. I wonder for the fact that Anir had apparently forgotten they had set up a bunch of glaives over in the back for raiding purposes, because at this point... Dimefrain is entirely well equipped to deal with this, right as the bandits return. If Anir had attacked any sooner, that could have been a much more successful raid. I mean, the Lotus still would have been a problem, but seven glaives getting into that against an unupgraded commander, unupgraded engineer commander? Now, nah, that could have been a win. That could have been a massive win. But 
That's the thing, you gotta remember where your forces are, and that's a difficult thing to remember sometimes. Not gonna blame Anir for that one. However, intelligently on Anir's part, they do have more Reavers coming in here, and that being said, Dime Friend has decided to go more for the complex shield army. Thug Law Ball with Rogue and Racketeer support. Hasn't been built up yet, but it should soon enough. Essentially the counter to what we're seeing right, right now with the Reavers. And with the Glaive support, this actually could work out pretty well. Unfortunately, the Lotus doing its job, and you're not microing to target that, which, had they done so, again, would probably have been a lot of damage. But again, I kind of see why they didn't. It's just unfortunate that it didn't work out. So now that the Thugs are out, the Outlaws will be coming in fairly shortly, and from that will be Rogues. I mean, this overall setup, especially as it gets built up, is going to be exceedingly difficult to counter. I mean, it's not as hard as we saw last game with... Yeah, oh yeah, we're... Sorry, our affiliates is pointing the game is alive. Yes, it is. This is enough a live game that there are matches being played that I can't get replays off of. Thank you for noticing. But yeah, we saw last game with the Ripper... Not the Rippers, what are they called now? Well, the what slashers are called now, which actually I think is... Oh, bloody hell, I can't remember. Anyway, the Slashers. Fencers. Fencers is what they're called now. The Fencers. We saw the last game with the Fencers, how the Thugs were able to counter that, and the Reavers slash Warriors are going to have about the same trouble. They are going to be able to deal with the supporting bandits. That's the big thing. The supporting bandit is the pro is the main issue, and that's what the Reavers help with. The Ronin slash Rocco. That's just helping with the Thugs, though admittedly, even that's kind of tricky. I don't expect to ever see the what was called Zeus, now called Knight. I don't expect to see that used against Thug, even though it would allow for a lot more shield destruction. But those just aren't in meta. Like, no one really uses them anymore. They're kind of expensive. They're kind of slow. Their attack only hits one target at a time. It's very strong, but they're still kind of slow, and considering the amount of bandits on the field, I kind of see why you might not want to use them. That being said, though, they just rip through shields like it's butter. Like, on top, the damage, on top of the fact that the EMP damage damages shields directly, it's, it's huge. But that being said, that's, Valiant Effort on the Reaver's part to try to get in here. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of success. That really is the job for the Ronin, and with that, that's it for the Reavers. More are coming, Anir does have them in queue, but it's going to take a while for them to be built up, and I don't see them happening any time that's going to be relevant for combat. There is one more. But again, not as relevant for combat. The bandits are pretty much all obsoleted, and Dying Friend knows it. They have none. There are no bandits left on the field, so at this point, Reavers aren't really necessary anyway. So overall, I'd say Anir's not doing too badly. The Ronin are definitely the way to go at this point. I still would love to see how Knights fare here, but again, the Ronin are doing their job. And that job is breaking through the Thug Ball. And that's the first set of Thugs gone with actually pretty good value for Anir. At this point, Anir does have the metal value destroyed advantage. I mean, they're still working on getting, obviously, the rest of the advantages as well, because they need to get advantages in metal used as well as metal produced, ideally. And Dying Friend has, I don't know, as you can see, about an 1800 metal advantage for metal used. 500 metal destroyed is a good start in reversing that trend, however. And Anir overall has a decently strong economy. Expansion over to the east would be favorite. I'd like to see that. But at this point, if they're able to maintain value against this army, it could work out anyway. I mean, the Reaver down, bit of a shame, but all the Ronin here have essentially nothing countering them. All the bandits are dead. The rogues aren't really doing much, at least not forward. So this could work out. Though Anir's commander under heavy threat in the process. Still, though, Anir is managing to get almost, at this point, a thousand metal value. They could very easily turn this around just by destruction alone. And with that, Anir's army, if it's big enough... It could at least hold its own to be able to expand, and the eastern side has been expanded to exactly as I wanted to see. I'm glad of that. And on top of that, Dying Friends Commander getting under heavy threat. There is not enough defenses here to stop these glaives. Possibly stop them from killing the commander. It's a little unclear, given that the commander has the lightning gun. But the commander is definitely the target. However, with the lightning gun, and I'm pretty sure to splash damage on it, it's going to be a problem. Very clear, obvious problem. And no, it doesn't have splash damage, apparently. But still... It's enough damage overall. There was enough. If the defenses had been targeted first and then the commander, I could see maybe having the glaives work. That was what I expected Anir to do. Apparently, Anir just wanted the commander dead, and there isn't enough firepower with those glaives. There might be enough with the rest of the forces coming in here, but that does open things. Anir might get a counterattack from Dying Friend. 
Although Diamond clearly far too focused on saving the commander to go for that, or at least they were, but now they've changed their mind, and with these rows going over towards Anir's commander, it's a little unclear how this is going to work out. Overall, though, Anir has the advantage. The massive advantage. Three rogues against commander compared to half a dozen, well, basically a dozen units overall. Nine Ronin and three Reavers coming in to get rid of Diamond commander, which looks to at least be scaring the commander. Taking the eastern side of the map from here shouldn't be too much of a challenge. But, of course, the counterattack with the rogues over to the western side, having a bit of a hard time actually getting ground. Coming from the low ground with the Gauss turret on top, there isn't a whole lot they've got to really work with. The Gauss turret might go down, but then another one on a pillar afterwards. There's no easy way that's going to be taken care of. And at this point, Anir, they've gotten 2,500 metal advantage destroyed, and the metal used difference is even less than that. It's only 1,700 different. So Anir at this point has a massive... They should have a unit value advantage very directly, and yes, they do! Just now, for the first time in this game, they've do, they have managed to get a unit value advantage thanks to the use of Mass Ronin Rush, which pretty well counters the Thug Law Bowl. I, uh, I'm a bit surprised we didn't see more bandits. I'm a little bit surprised we didn't see more Racketeers, though really bandits are the main counter you'd use. And I mean, granted, there are the Reavers. Those get in the way. And that's what the Racketeers are before. Racketeers to paralyze, to the, disarm the Reavers, and then bandits to rush in and wreck the Ronin's face. But, even with that... We have the Firewalker. And the Firewalker is here. And also, if you want to know where you can buy this game, you can't. It's free. But you can download it either at 0k.info or there's a new itch.io page. It's like 0k.itch.io, if I'm not mistaken. And there's a dash in the 0k.info 0 0 0 for the actual game. That It'll be in the description where you can download the game. Back to the game, though. I'm here managing to manage... Get well, managing to get that economic advantage working beautifully. Of course, at this point, they need their caretakers. It seems like they were a little bit too focused on the battle in the front, which is fine. I mean, that happens. They were very focused on the battle in front, and that does mean their economy got a bit stally. They got a little bit of excess, but not too much. Only a few hundred metal. Like, it's only a few hundred metal over dive front. Overall, Anir is clearly finding their feet now that they've managed to get that one really good battle. They've gotten the entire north side of the map. Anir is on top of this. Dying throwing with the Firewalkers, though, I really like that move. It's a very common move, very in-meta, and for good reason. Firewalkers just are the most effective artillery in the game. They set up an entire burning field, well, at least the most effective artillery in the game as far as the meta is concerned. They set up a big burning field, get rid of pretty much all skirmishers, which oftentimes matches become battles of. And then from there, it's just a matter of dealing with whatever comes through, and they're already on fire. They're heavily damaged. No problems there. That being said, Dimefriend is in a good spot to help defend. Like, they can work this out. They can defend this. Their Firewalkers are making it actually hard for Anir to get in. And Anir, they do have nothing but Cloakybot Factory. They have the Phantoms, which they are trying to use to stop the Firewalkers. But, unfortunately, the first one does manage to get spotted. There are more, however. Or at least there will be more very shortly if there aren't already. Ah, come on, where are you? Oh yeah, there's plenty more. It's already three on the field on top of the one being produced, so overall, this is still in a pretty good spot. And overall, Anir does still have a decently large metal destroyed advantage. Yeah, it's 3,000 at this point, considering that the unit value, or the metal used, is about even. Yeah, unit value is still way in Anir's favor. But a lot of that is invested into Phantoms. That's 750 each. Remember, there's four of them on the field so far. Well, three of them on the field so far, but there were four before. That's 3,000 metal at least invested into Phantoms. If they're able to nail the Firewalkers, they're in a really good position, but the problem, of course, is the fire, which detects them. Also, why are they not targeting the Firewalker? And you're, why are you not microing these to target the Firewalker? I am very curious as to that. I wonder if that's a big team game instinct or what. I was like, the whole point of using these is to snipe the Firewalkers. That's the entire point. If you get, if you snipe the Firewalkers, Dying Friend has very little to work with. And Anir coming in with planes, some Ravens to snipe the Firewalkers instead, which, I mean, that'll work. It's just a little bit riskier. Anti-air is obviously more of a thing, on top of the fact that Racketeers can disable them. But hey, the value has been grabbed! There is still value! And clearly the Phantom just used as essentially long-range Raka, or long-range Ronin. Long-range self-destructive Ronin, as one of them just decided to kill its friend. Bit of a shame, that. Still, though, Anir does have a massive advantage. They have almost 
well, I have a 3,000 metal, destroyed advantage. They've been pretty much on par with unit production. Unit value is still 3,500 metal ahead. Although, yeah, metal use as well. Metal use has gone up. Like, overall, Anir is just in a very strong position economically, just not an overwhelmingly strong one. And that's the big thing. Anir can be destroyed at this point. Dimethorin hasn't lost. They're in a bit of a disadvantageous position, and they have to deal with the Phantom as well, which, again, the Firewalker is actually pretty good at dealing with. At least for, you know, setting up fire, setting up giant fields full of fire that the Phantoms can't run through. So, it's a bit of a problem here for Dimefriend, which, at this point, is a bit too much of a problem for Dimefriend, evidently. Anir does take that match. Dimefriend, seeing the writing on the wall, at least as far as the fact that they can't easily deal with the Phantoms goes, and decides to go for it. A bit surprised, though, because Shieldbots do have the dirt bag, but at the same time, I mean, you had... Yeah, Thunderbirds coming in, you had Ravens coming in. Anir did have 3,000 metal worth of units more than Dimefriend. And unless Dimefriend would have been able to somehow completely annihilate this, say, this group of Glaives, for instance, there was no way that, and I mean, without losing any units of their own, there was no way Dimefriend was going to be able to get back in that metal value-wise. And then in terms of just units in general, the Firewalkers were kind of their only hope. If they were able to take out Anir's army in the process, particularly this group of the Reavers and Ronin, and open things up that way, then yeah, I could see being quite a lot of value going Dimefriend's way and managing evening out the match, but I don't think Dimefriend saw they could do that, and I don't blame them. That's a tough position to be in. But anyway, that match is that match. The next match is going to be between North Chilean G and Dimefriend, which is kind of a classic matchup at this point. They fight each other all the time, because I only... I generally only pick matchmaker matches to cast, and North Chilean G and Dimefriend are both common users of the matchmaking system. Also, Ophelia's in chat. Good comment. What are ticks and roaches, really? I mean, come on, what, what's a ticker? What's a roach? What, what do they do? Yeah, they would have won the match, actually, for either player had they been used. That's a very fair point. Yeah, ticks and roaches are lifesavers. So those of you not familiar, and actually, it's no longer called a tick. I can't remember what it's called now. Check the factory. That's been renamed to Imp. But yeah, that's the thing, is those, the imp, or was called tick, EMP, suicide bomb, and the roach is just an EMP bomb. Or sorry, it's a suicide bomb. You lay it down, it explodes, deals loads of damage, usually kills an entire army. Extremely useful, extremely difficult to use well. But anyway, that is that, so like I said, the next match, North Chilean G and Dimefriend, stay tuned for that, it'll be up in a couple of minutes.